This is awesome. You know, we're kicking off the first ever Ice Team podcast. I got my good friend Jason Durham here across. Going to co-host this thing. I'll tell you what, this guy's a lot more entertaining than I am. So I'm super pumped to see what we can uh, pull together this ice fishing season. Jason, this is going to be a good time. This is going to be a great time, Matt. I've been looking forward to this. And uh, we're not going to be together very often. Unfortunately, no. Or fortunately, I guess you can say. Well, one of the two. <laughs> But no, this is going to be a whole lot of fun. We got a lot of stuff planned. Honestly, uh, you and I have been spitballing a lot behind the scenes. We don't even know exactly where this is going to go and who we're going to talk to and the angles we're going to approach. So uh, this is season one. We are rookies at this. So this is going to be a, a little bit of a trial. Hopefully not much air, but hey, it's probably going to happen. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty jacked up. I'm really excited for it. I've, I've already been thinking about some of the guests that I'd like to have on here. And I'm hoping that they accept the invite. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they're going to decline. I don't want to sit across the table from you, but I'm <laughs> going to try. But one of the big things, too, about this podcast, educating people about angling, having some great stories, some great humor. Uh, but we want the public to have some input into that, too. Absolutely. Like if, they have, if you have questions, if you have an idea for a guest that you'd like to see on the show, we want to hear about that. Yep. Yeah, and you can hit us up on any of our social media platforms, send us a message, uh, talk to us at a show. I mean, not to get too, uh, give away too much, but we're going to film and film and video a lot of these podcasts from booths at sports shows, whether it's Ramsey, maybe St. Paul, we don't know, right? So if you see us at a show, by all means, come on up and say, what about this? What about this topic? Uh, and I, I love, Jason and I were chatting before we went live here and he had, a, he had a great point, you know, one thing to address is what this podcast will not be about. You know, you want to involve, indulge <laughs> yeah, a little bit yeah. on some of that? I mean, I think about when I take guide clients out, whether it's on the ice or, or in my boat, that there's a couple things we just simply don't talk about. One is politics. Yep. We're, this is not going to be a political show whatsoever. Yep. Um, we don't talk about religion. Mm -hmm. it's, it, everybody has their own idea and opinion, and that's not going to be a focus of this show. We want this to be open-ended. We want to talk about fishing, what's coming up in the industry, techniques, how to make people better anglers. And Ice Team, the focus from the very beginning was educating yep. anglers. Absolutely. And we want to continue that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, obviously there's going to be some mentions of products. We know that it's going to happen. You know, we have a, a phenomenal group of partners at Ice Team, um, whether it's Clam Outdoors, Vexlar, uh, you, know, you know the gamut. You can see that on the website. Uh, but there's going to be some tangents. I can tell you right now, and, and that's what we're going to pride ourselves on here, is just having that open-ended conversation with whoever we have on, or at times, more than one people on. So we're, we got some ideas brewing. Uh, but yeah, Jason nailed it. We're looking to just keep this very fluid, very open-ended, keep the conversation going, make sure you learn something. Uh, maybe we learn something. I don't know. I plan, I'm going to learn something from you today. I always do every time we hang out. Well, I know I'm going to learn yeah. more than one thing. <laughs> I'm not in school today. I'm not the teacher today, but I'm going to be the uh, student for sure. Uh, but one thing that it's not going to be is a hardcore product plug. Right. It's not going to be jamming, uh, you know, equipment right. down your throat from, from any brand. We right. don't want to do this. is not going to be a sales pitch by any means. We just want to have fun. We right. want to help people catch some more fish. We want to entertain people. Maybe you're heading up to the north part of the state. You know, if you're in Minnesota, if you're heading to the UP, sure. you've got some car time. This yep. is something you might want to yep. put on the dial. We want to tell stories. And maybe some stories we've never heard. And honestly, I want to hear stories I've never heard. So uh, I got my wheels are turning, and I know I can tell you your wheels are turning. I've known you <laughs> well. <laughs> my wheels are turning. Jason Durham's <laughs> wheels turn all the time. So uh, I'm super pumped up. So, again, to reiterate, um, for those of you listening or tuning in, you know, hit us up with ideas. Uh, we're learning with you on how this uh, podcast game is going to work for us. So if you got ideas or things you want to see or hot topics or whatever, uh, we'll do our best. I think we can't promise we're going to cover all of them, but we'll do our best to at least try to, to fill in some time to address the important stuff. So that's awesome. So, you know, like Jason alluded to, like, we're not going to be across from each other probably 
much at all this entire no. year. We're going to co-host this. Jason's going to be wherever. I'm going to be wherever. We might cross paths at certain shows and events. So I, I think it, I'd be remiss to not say, Jason, you need to be on the hot seat just a little bit here <laughs> because I know you're going to be interviewing people all season, much like myself. So I came with a few topics about Jason Durham because uh, I would be remiss, honestly, that if uh, if this podcast – um, didn't pertain to Jason as a co-host, I would have you on. So well, I, I, I'm going to have a few things for you here I feel today. honored for you to tell me that. Uh, so are you nervous? No, I don't get nervous. <laughs> I, I'm a little nervous for you, but uh, no, I'll keep, I'll keep it, keep it clean for sure. Um, I would like to wait before... a second. Wait a second. Why did you have to say that, that you're going to keep it clean? I mean, uh, I, I, yeah. I don't feel like that should even be a consideration. Fair enough. You know, but if anyone, anyone knows Jason, and I'm sure most of you tuning in know who Jason Durham is, is, you know, you're, you're very entertaining. And I mean that with all due respect, like, you know, you light up a room. I love it. You know, I think whether it's a sports show, whether it's uh, doing a seminar, whether it's and we'll get to this, what you do every day as a kindergarten teacher. Like, you know, uh, without being too corny and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes, like we're very blessed to have you involved in a lot of what we do because I think you do just bring a positive light. And I always say this often, um, not to toot our co-host horn a ton, is like I've always said the world needs more Jason Durham. Gosh. And, I, and I use that term endearing not just as a person, but just what you bring to everything you do. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen Jason upset. I haven't. I've never seen you not smiling, half glass full. And I'll tell you what, that's, that's you know, I think that's contagious. Uh, so, like I said, you're not getting off the hot seat. I got some fun <laughs> stuff to talk about. Well, first I, I just got to say, good. Matt, thank you. Sure. I mean, wow, that warms the cockles of my heart. Yeah. That, was, that was just, wow. Yeah, yeah. no, we're going to have some fun. And this is part of the reason when we thought about this project – um, and I brought it up to Jason. I mean, this was infancy stages. I mean, we probably could oh, just yeah. quickly touch on how this even came to fruition. I mean, you and I were having some conversations about different things, and the podcast idea came up, and we talked about it at Clam and Ice Team, and I don't think I got 30 seconds into a conversation with you when you said, I'm in. And, and, I'm doing this. <laughs> and then on the backside, as I'm driving home thinking, what did I get myself <laughs> into? I, you know, I don't know what this is going to entail. Yeah. But we're going to find out. Yeah. And, and we're going to learn together. And, and, and we've said the same thing. I know Drew, uh, the guy behind the curtain, you know, you guys know Drew Aspinwall, if you're following along on what we're doing. Uh, he's kind of the brains behind this entire podcast in terms of making it tick. He'll be editing it. He'll be doing all that stuff. He runs our social media. And we've talked. We already got some stuff kind of in the hopper that we're kind of excited about, as I know you do, too. So... But like I said, we're going to we'll probably hit some bumps, some obstacles, uh, but that's that's part of the game. But we thought, like you alluded to, to start this segment, Ice Team. It's all about education. That's been our goal from day one, and we really want to bring some of that back on the forefront. And we thought, what other ways can we and be educational? Uh, and, and the podcast just seemed very natural. So while a lot of what you're going to listen to here throughout the season is going to be audio, uh, we're going to try to tie in a little bit of visual. Uh, not 100% sure what that is yet. You and I talked, but, you know, I would expect for those of you watching this podcast that if that's more of your cup of tea, there may be some things this season you're going to want to partake in visually as well. So uh, I'm excited with that. So, I mean, I'm pumped. You're pumped. I'm pumped. Yeah. I'm pumped. I'm pumped for the ice season. I know a lot of people are, mm -hmm. man, on social media right now, have you seen all of the posts? I saw up north uh, on the Canadian border, there was a skim of ice. There was. There was a skim of ice. And it's just gone bananas. It's gone viral. Yep. There are more people ice fishing today yep. than there ever have been in history. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's blown up so much. It's exciting to see. However, we have to talk about the last few months. Of course. You know, in the last few months, you know, it's funny. We're an ice team podcast, right? So, of course, the, the, the immediate assumption is it's going to be all about ice fishing. Well, to some degree, of course. But, like yourself, we guide all summer. Yeah. You know, in fact, not to get too ahead of steam, you're looking to bolt when we're done with this because you're going to go I fishing. Wanna, I want to get done with this today because <laughs> it's going to be 50 degrees. In Minnesota, it's MEA weekend, so we have a four-day weekend. I don't teach for four days. I've got some guide trips, but I have today off. I drove yeah. all the way down here to do this. Thank you. I want... I, 
I'm not going to get caught speeding on the way home. I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to speed on the way home because I'm not yeah. going to. But I can't wait to get on the water today. It's yeah. going to be beautiful. Going to chase some walleye, some smallmouth, probably get some pike thrown in there. Nice. Who knows what? Yeah, I'm a little envious and jealous of you. So, I mean, talking about the, the last several months before we jump into more of what this uh, meat and potatoes exists, what are some of your favorite memories from this season? And, and I know oh my God. I have one with you on the open water side that, that I'll, I'll touch on, but you're guiding people all, all the time from all over the country. And how many years have you been? I think I saw a post. I don't want to miss say, but you've been guiding for 30, <laughs> 30 years. years? It's been 30 years. So I, I started guiding when I was 15. And, you know, a lot of people go, well, how is that even possible? How do you, how do you start guiding when you're 15? You know, it was just serendipitous. Uh, it was a, a gift from the universe, really, the way that it all happened. I was working at my uncle's tackle shop. A guy stopped in looking for a guide. We had one guide in the area. He was booked, and I showed the guy where to fish, how to fish, and he said, well, why don't you just guide me? And I said, well, I'm not a guide. And he said, I'll pay you $35 for a half day. <laughs> You're a guide now. <laughs> well, I was making about three seventy-five minimum wage, so it sounded like a good deal. We went out, and, and it went great, and my parents helped me out along the way 30 years later. Wow. But talking about this last season, and, and, and you mentioned the people that, that get into my boat, and I know you have the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, the first thing that I would say, because I get asked this question almost every single day, have you ever had a jerk in the boat? Sure. And I can tell you with 100% honesty, never once in 30 years. And that's thousands of clients. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple reasons for that. And, and one is, number one, it's pretty difficult to be upset about anything when you're right. out on the lake. Right. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not high strung. I'm, I'm not in your face. Uh, barking at you. If you lose a fish at the side of the boat, that's on you. Right. And, and it's not something that I'm going to carry and be upset about. Um, even if you broke equipment, every day I give my safety speech in the boat. There, there's just a couple, couple rules. Number one, don't fall out. <laughs> and on the ice, it's Good rule. don't fall through. Right. Um, and the rule number two is I've never been hooked. Don't be the first person to do it. Right. And everybody's really, really careful about it. When you put them um, on, on notice like that, then they go, oh, I don't want to be the first person. And then rule number three is there's no apologies. Sure. And, and what I mean by that is as we fish, you might lose a fish, you might break a rod, you might break a line. It, it doesn't matter. That's all fishing. So, so I, I try to tell people every day, two things are probably going to happen. And, and on the open water, it's you're going to catch weeds and you're going to get <laughs> tangles. That's just, that you're, that's just going to happen. And if you already have that in your mind, that that's a part of the day, then when it happens, it's not a big deal. It's not right. a setback. On the ice, it's like, we're, we're probably going to break a line, and, and that's okay. Sure. You're going you're to get caught on the ice at some point, um, and you're going to get a tangle. Right. You're going to get these tangles. And for the, for the listeners, the, the one tip I can give you today that, <laughs> that's going to help everybody out is it's typically – a lot faster for you to cut your line and start over mm -hmm. than it is to work through that puzzle of the tangle. Just, just cut your losses. Absolutely. Just tie one knot instead of spending 15 or 20 minutes trying to untangle this mess. I mean, I do have one question. Well, I got lots, but are your rates still the same? Because <laughs> uh, they, they've changed. You got any openings? How, how, would, I, how would I say this? Uh, they've changed increasing exponentially. I hope I'm guessing so. the same for you. What about you, Matt? Yeah. I mean, you've taken so many people. How many years have you been doing? This? I just, I'm just finishing up my 22nd year guiding. 22 and, years. And I started when I was 18 when I went to college and just said I, I was playing full time sports. I was full time student, and I said there's no way I can work at an Arby's or a department store for whatever dollars an hour and make it worth my time. It wasn't meant to be egotistical. It was just the reality of things. So I started guiding my freshman year of college. Um, got a little lucky, right place at the right time. Met some great people. Um, got a great opportunity to jump into a boat and uh, started guiding. But, dude, you nailed it right on the head. I mean, I, so many guides, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't say so many guides. That's overgeneralizing. But a lot of guides fixate on the fish. Yeah. Like, I got to get a limit. Yep. You got to go home with what a dinner. Where, to be honest, Jason, if I get a client that calls me or messages me, and a lot of my business now is repeat, I'm not doing it full time. I'm doing about 100 trips in open water season. You're doing probably 300. And 
But a lot of my clients, if I get someone that says, hey, man, can you put me on a limit of walleyes? I usually don't even take that trip. You know, my entire focus is, you know, I go back and forth with my client and I say, what are 10 questions you want answered in this five-hour trip? I want to sit with you prior to understand what those 10 things are you want to learn, and I will structure the day based off of that. I've had days, probably like you, where I've talon down on the bank, and I have not left that spot on the bank, not in the water even, for three hours as I taught someone to tie every knot in the book or how to rig drop shots or how to do this or how to do that or how to understand your electronics. I had one day uh, last summer where the entire day the client wanted to run the trolling motor. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to run the trolling motor. They wanted to know. They're looking at potentially buying a boat. They wanted to know if this is for them. It was a windy day. I'm like, knock yourself out. You're not going to break anything. For three and a half of the five hours, he just sat up front running the trolling motor. He didn't have a rod in his hand, Look, figuring out how it works, how to navigate. Like, and I think one thing, uh, one of the many things you do well, as you said right from the get-go as a guide, is you educate, right? Like, and I know it's in your blood. That, that's what you do every day, whether it's on or off the water or the ice. But I think as a fishing guide and why you're so successful is I think you've made that your focus. Your clients leave on a day on the boat or on the ice going, I just learned a bunch of stuff. So it's one thing to take a client out fishing and say, here's a rod, cast right there, do exactly this, you caught a fish, nice job. But if that person can't leave the boat or the ice that day going, what did I do and how can I do that on my own? From my perspective, I didn't do my job. Exactly. I didn't do my job. I, I always think of it from a standpoint of what you're really giving the person is confidence. Right. You know, when I was, when I was really young as a guide, and <laughs> I was going to pose this to you as, you know, we've made mistakes. Yeah. We've made mistakes over the years, especially when you're young and you're naive. There's things that I wish I could go back and change that, you know, mm -hmm. man, that was a poor decision or whatever, getting caught out in a rainstorm when yep. you when today you'd go, we're just going to sit here for 40 minutes and it's going to pass instead of going out and getting drenched because you're so focused on, I want them to catch a big fish. Right. Um, but, but a lot of people, they just want confidence to go. Mm -hmm. and, and whether that's from a fishing report or it's from their guide showing them the techniques or the areas that they need to fish, they want somebody to tell them, do this and it might work for you. Right. And it might not. Right. I mean, it's not going to work in every situation. Right. You know, you love, you love to throw plastics in the mm -hmm. weeds a lot, and on Minnetonka especially. Now, you can go to a lot of lakes in the state of Minnesota and do that. Sure. But you can't do it on every lake. Right. You know, I was thinking about the lake I was on last weekend. It really, it doesn't have any weeds. It has no weeds. Yeah. And, and you can still use that same technique, but it's not going to be the same. Right. So you have to make some alterations. But people want that confidence. I was thinking about when I was... I, I don't even know how old, uh, probably a late teenager. And I went into our local bait shop and I asked them, you know, hey, what's been biting? Because that's a common thing. We say, stop in at your local bait shop. They'll give you some ideas of where to go and what to use and whatnot. And even though I fish the lakes all the time, I was still like, hey, what have you heard? <clears throat> and they said, oh, the crappies. Fish Hook Lake, the crappies are going crazy. Cabbage weed, 12 feet of water. They're catching limits and limits of them. So I go out to Fish Hook Lake, a lake that I, at that time, didn't fish very often. Okay. And had all the confidence in the world. I'm going to go out, I'm going to catch these giant crappies, limits of them. I got out on the lake and realized there are a ton of areas that are 12 feet deep with cabbage <laughs> weeds. So it kind of, you know, it hit home right away like, oh, this isn't as easy as I think it is. Um, but I had that confidence going into it that it was going to persuade me to go. Yep. And that's one thing I say in, in seminars. I say it on the radio. I say it in the boat. If you want to catch more and bigger fish, you simply have to go fishing. Right. That's the only way. Right. And you nailed it with confidence. I mean, it is confidence is king. And it's whether it's a, a technique, uh, whether it's uh, a spot, uh, whether it's even the day of fishing. Do you have oh, confidence? Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you can replace confidence. And, and we, we do a lot of seminars. I know you're doing more than me, but... The confidence side of things I always address, and a lot of times it, it manifests in usually a technique because that just seems to be more applicable during a seminar for ice fishing or whatever. And a lot of it comes down to people have their confidence baits or oh, their yeah. confidence technique, oh, and yeah. they don't want to stray. They don't want to move outside of that. And, and the best way to build confidence is honestly when something's working. 
Yes. Not when it's not working. Like say, take for plastics, plastics, for example, on the ice side. If I got someone that's never used plastics, someone's never tied on a Mackie in their life, no problem. That's okay. They fish maggots their whole life. Probably caught a lot of fish. When nothing's biting, that's usually not the time <laughs> no. to try a plastic. So what I do with my clients is we get on a hot bite, whether it's a numbers game or whatever, right, that the stars are aligning. That's when I'll say, no, 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 don't rebate. Use the plastic because it's just mental. It's confidence. They drop down and go, oh, they're eating this just the same. But if nothing's biting your jig, your favorite jig is packed with maggots, there's a good chance they're not going to bite your favorite jig with a plastic on it. I will say, yeah. however, I did have a day uh, filming with Chip Lear. Sure. Where it was that case. Oh. Where, they, where really they would not bite on a maggot, and we put on plastics, and, they and we crushed fish, yeah. and, and it was amazing. But that's definitely right. not the norm. Right. But, but, but people want to think sometimes. They think, okay, the fish aren't biting. On my high confidence presentation, mm -hmm. now I'm going to take out something I've never done before because this is going to be the right. magic bullet. My buddy Jeremy and I, uh, Jeremy Anderson, who guides with me up north in Park Rapids, uh, we talk about um, his dad. His dad at, at fishing tournaments, and not just his dad, but a lot of people fishing tournaments, where they go to the tackle shop the night before the tournament. And they're walking up and down the aisle. They, they maybe need to pick out two favorite bait. Oh, I need one more of these, you know, jigs or trailers or whatever. But then they see this other bait. And they go, oh, I think that's going to be the, like, that's going to be the secret bait for the event. And they buy a couple of those. And then they see another one. Oh, this might, they might go on this. And then they eventually get into the boat. And all they use is their confidence yeah. bait anyway. Yeah. So the secret baits, the secret baits don't oftentimes come out as the the headliner for the day it's right. probably going to be your your confidence bait look at gens mm -hmm. look at dave you know he he fishes maggots he fishes plastic he he fishes jigs you know that that's his go-to stuff right right and if he goes to an area and they're not biting on his high confidence presentation he changes where he's at right. and, and he will say those aren't the fish i want to catch right i want to catch the fish that want to eat the bait, the way that I want to fish. Right. And you always hear the term, like, the fish aren't biting today. I'm not a huge believer in that. Now, you have some environmental situations, weather-driven, sure. that can maybe shut fish off for yeah. periods of time, right? Yeah. But we're not talking about a, a super, super intelligent species. And I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'd say that relative because right. we get our butts whooped at times, All right, time. by these fish. But at the end of the day, you know, when I hear the term, like, oh, they're not biting. My question is usually follow up with, okay, what were you using? Oh, there's only one thing I use. Yeah. I use a chartreuse, whatever. <laughs> well, that's all you fished all day? Yep. If they don't bite that, they're not eating. Well, you know, like you alluded to, well, did you move? Nope. They always bite on the edge of this basin, and that's where they are every night, and they yeah. were not biting tonight. Well, if you never made a move, and if you never changed maybe your approach or your cadence or the lure you're fishing, you really don't have a great base to say the fish are not biting today. And so, and it's never me trying to... to to be rude to anybody it's just I, i'm just asking the questions now if somebody comes to me and there's like and they're not biting today oh yeah man i i fished 14 spots on lake a changed my baits 10 times changed my line changed my cadence fish live bait fish plastics i went to lake b did this it's just well maybe there's some stuff going on today with a fish or tight lift right then you kind of go okay i'm kind of getting the whole story but i'll tell you what jason as you know that's rarely the case usually it's went to my favorite lake hit my two favorite spots, use my favorite presentation, oh, they're just not going today. Right. You know, so that's where you look at some of these anglers that adapt and how successful they are. I mean, you look at, like, these professional bass fishermen, right, fishing the BASS or whatever. If you look at the bottom of their boat after a day of pre-fishing, a day of practice, it's comical. I just saw a post on social media here with, I think it was Anthony Gagliardi and Jacob Wheeler were pre-fishing for a huge bass fishing tournament right now. And Anthony just put a, posted a picture, bird's eye view of him standing, looking towards Jacob. 30 rods all over the deck of the boat, stuff everywhere. And, he, and he's like, wow, something along the lines of, hope it's a little easier tournament day. Like, but that shows you, even at the supreme level of their ability, these are the best at their game, right? they're still throwing the gamut at these fish when they're practicing, trying to figure out the pattern. Now, if they went out there that day with one rod, one lure, fished one way, and said it's not happening, or obviously they're not on that same level. Right. So 
that's just things we, we sometimes, you know, lose sight of. And I do it too. I mean, I'll be honest. I have my favorite ways of catching fish, and I may not set that down all morning, uh, even as I'm getting my butt whooped. Yep. And, and, I, and I, learn, I need to listen to my own preaching at time, right? So, uh, but those are just simple things that all tie back into confidence, being adapt, adapting a bit, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, having fun with it. I was thinking of, we were talking about this podcast and not knowing what direction it's going to go and, and how it's going to evolve and everything. And I was thinking about it in terms of a day of tournament fishing. Sure. That, or even just fishing in general, that you might have a plan of how, of what you envision it's going to be like and you go out and then you have to adapt and it's going to change throughout the day and it's going to be fluid. And it's the same with this. Yeah. It, we, we, could, we could go into one of these podcasts and go, <laughs> okay, this is what's going to happen today, and this is our plan, and then we're going to have to change because that's okay. not what's going to happen. Are you reading my mind? I, because I, yes. I have a, a few bullet points here, and we haven't got to any of them yet, and we're probably halfway through this thing, Drew, I'm guessing. No? So we're thinking, 25 minutes in, and here and we are. we've talked about nothing. Well, that's what we do. Okay. I mean, I you mean, and I could I, talk about whatever for – an hour. You asked if I could read your mind. Yes. Monster energy, uh, peanut butter, um, plastic worms. Am I right? He's okay. good. He's good. I thought so. You're good. Yeah, yeah. You're, you've got it dialed in. Uh, no, that's awesome. So I, th- I guess to, to move on a little bit, you know, because I know we're going to sway again. It's just how we do things. <laughs> you know, I did allude that I'm going to drill you down a little bit. And I, and I want to. I'm excited about this. I got some things I, I want to ask you, and I got some things I think people want to hear. You know, I mean, I think we need to take a little step back on, you know, who Jason Durham really is. And, and I'm not saying that on a, you know, a philo- philosophical level. Is that the word? Philosophical. Okay. Yeah. C student to teacher. Um, <laughs> but you're a teacher by trade, man, and, and, I, and I love it. I mean, I know you teach kindergarten. Uh, you're heavily involved in the community. Um, you know, is that what you visioned for yourself? Let's say, so you, <laughs> 30 years ago, you met said people at a bait shop for 35 bucks and you went out fishing. You know, fast forward now, you're still guiding, obviously, still doing the tournament thing at times, still doing the promotional thing, all that. But, you know, when did you decide, like, I want to teach because I'll tell you what you're very good at it. But well, I've always been interested to hear how that came about. I didn't know that's what I wanted. That was not something that I had planned. Like like you hear people that say I've wanted to do this since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. That wasn't part of my plan. Sure. Um, you know, we you take those career ed classes in high school and you do these inventories and checklists of of what your interests are and everything. And in that career class, I remember going through these big catalogs of salaries more than anything that's what my buddies and i were all looking at (laughs) what is the salary for this job and we're all going to be in the medical field of course why not Uh, my one buddy was going to be an occupational therapist and i looked at it and i go you know i'm going to be an occupational therapist and he and i both went up to the university of north dakota in grand forks Uh, we we went through the flood up there Um, i spent a short time playing football got to uh, tackle somebody you know Jim Klein Saucer. That was. Uh, Do you still hurt today from it or what? Him? Oh yeah, I'm sure he's really paying for it. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> um, was in the OT program and I, I had done all this field work and I realized I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Like the money was becoming less important mm-hmm. and the joy of the job. And that's where I'm so blessed that when I go to work, I don't work. When sure. I when I'm teaching school. It, it never feels like work. When I'm guiding, it never feels like work. People ask me all the time, do you ever get tired of teaching? Do you ever get tired of fishing? No, never. Every single day I'm excited to get up. So I had been up at Grand Forks going in this OT program, realized I didn't want to do it, went through this massive flood that put the entire city underwater and was really at this crossroads of my life and trying to figure out what to do. Took a year off of school, which a lot of people, when they take a year off of college, they don't go back. But the best thing that ever happened for me was taking that year off. And I just worked in the construction trade, realized I really didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I have a lot of respect for construction workers. And uh, on, you know, kind of a, you know, suggestion from a friend, why don't you try education? I thought, you know what, I, I got to go down some path. Yeah. And, and after that very first day of class, it was intro to education. I came back and I said, I know this is what I want to do. And, and in comparison of looking in high school at those inventories and those salaries of 
what is the highest salary that I'm going to be comfortable in my lifetime and everything. Teaching does not fit into <laughs> that. I will tell you that it does not. But I'm so blessed. I, I feel like the universe has worked in, in my corner so many times throughout my life that I can teach and I can fish. Sure. And it's not just pe- a lot of people say, oh, well, you could just guide in the summer. No, I guide in the winter, too. I've got all of these holiday weekends that everybody wants to head up north. I've got those free and, and the weekends. And, of course, the summers, that's a bonus, right. too. So right. the hard part is getting paid for nine months of work and then having to make it up. I don't have really any teacher friends that don't have a second job. Right. But, you know, I, I think it's great. The, the other question that comes up a lot is, is this is kindergarten? Is that what you <laughs> want to teach? I figured it was your level of intellect. <laughs> so you had to pick which grade you would teach. You know, I'm not <laughs> great in geography. I'm going to admit that. And so this kind of fits the bill for that. But it was when I was in college and I was in that education program and working with these kids. I was working at the YMCA in Grand Forks. And I worked with everything from infants up to, as I'm in the schools through the university, up to fifth and sixth grade. Sure. And I, I just, I liked that young age. I liked how much progress they made. I liked how they were, they had so much wonderment, just interest in the world. Stuff that adults lose sight of because we're so used to it. And I mean, take for instance, uh, the first snow. These kids in kindergarten, they might remember one, maybe two other times in their lives that it snowed. So when we see that snow coming out the window of the classroom, we stop. We stop whatever we're doing. I don't care if we're in the middle of a whatever right we go outside and Those we moments. just stand because it's important to a kid and and i think it's important for adults to remember that something that might seem small and trivial to an adult is still a huge deal to a kid right so and i'll tell you what jason like you know you're spot on like and it's obvious that you love what you do and you're good i mean you know you always like i alluded to are half class full uh, and it's the cliche term like if you love your job you never work again right and, and it, it's it's work i mean i think you would be lying if you didn't say yeah they, they, teaching kindergarten it's not a super easy job all the time no. guiding is not always an no. easy job all the time you know promoting for brands it's not i mean it it's work still you know but it's so awesome to see and, and thank you for for going down that career path because i think honestly i think it's helped carve who you are i mean for sure i think it's helped you have that whether it's humility for life, that, that composure, that understanding, that I'm never going to get razzed by much, you know. And, and I'll tell you what, like, you know, I have four kids, and they're all, my youngest is now in second grade, but they all went through kindergarten. God bless you. <laughs> like, my wife's a para at an at a elementary school right now, and these kindergartners, they are... You know, I like to say piss and vinegar is a term grandpa used to tell me that we had as kids. It's a real thing. You know it. Like, you live it every day. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I guess on behalf of a parent, like, thank you. I mean, I think our educators, to a lot of degree, don't always get the credit they deserve. I got a sister that's a teacher. My mom was a para. You know, I hear the stories. And it's, uh, I mean, they're truly shaping our future. And, and, you know, not to get off topic at all, but, like, you mentioned the medical field and you looked at salaries and, and if I can uh, just do one shout out for my teacher friends, you are underpaid. I firmly believe that for what you do and what you bring to the table for honestly, the future of our families, our kids, our country, our cities, right? So now um, thanks for doing that. But yeah, I mean, for, for those out there that didn't know you as an elementary school or a kindergarten teacher specifically, uh, it probably brings some things full circle for some of your, your, people that maybe didn't know that about you that look about going ah oh, kind of makes sense um that he's weird and that, you know <laughs> but you have fun with it you know i do have fun with it I, I i love it so much i love that environment i love that age I, I think it's an absolute riot um and you know after going to und mm-hmm. and getting my I, my undergrad there i actually have a master's degree in education too originally i had thought about going into administration i will tell you honestly I have no desire to do that, mm-hmm. none. I like being with the kids. I like educating both the kids and the families because there's a lot of child development that, um, you know, parents 
don't know about. Because the only way you parent is the way that you were parented. Right. There is no manual that you get with a kid. Right. So it's all trial and error. It's just like fishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about this. Think about when, when you and I both started guiding years ago. We didn't have the internet. Mm -mm. We, waited, we waited for a month to get the newest issue of In Fisherman, and you, and you poured over it five, six, seven times, and you never threw one away. Right. That would be Still sacrilegious. Oh, yeah. yeah. It would be sacrilegious to throw one of those away because that was the only information we had. Or maybe you'd get a copy of Outdoor News or you know something like that that you'd get to glean some information from. And you couldn't just type in a question and ask it and have it right. answered. And now you can do that. Right. And that's advantageous not only for fishing, but for parents, too. If oh, yeah. they have a question about parenting, they can just look it up very, very quickly. Quick Google search. Right. Whereas... You know, for generations, it's whatever you, whatever experience you had from, from your upbringing, that's how you're going it, to parent. And it's good and bad, a it's gift and, and a curse. Bad. It's funny because, you know, I just found out we have something in common, you know, probably many things, but I was listening to your college life, right? You went to college, not sure what you're going to do. Um, you know, you took some time off. Uh, you played sports, whatever. I, I walked a similar path. You know, I left high school obsessed with sports, went to college to play sports. And ironically enough, I went to college as a freshman to become a teacher. <laughs> so I'm a little bit opposite of you. And I went there, uh, went down to, down to Mankato, wanted to be a high school math teacher. And if you ask most people listening, they're probably like, why would you want to do that? Why would anyone want to be a high school math teacher? Well, I was in my math teachers in high school were very impressionable. They were my coaches. They were my friends. And, and I thought of that. And, and I realized I, I changed career paths. But what I did much like you, which I think some of our younger listeners might appreciate, and even some of the parents, is instead of forcing a square peg down a round hole, I also took a year off. And I, and I refocused. I rechanneled my energy. And I changed what I wanted to do down into the communications side of things, which ultimately led me to where I am now, right? So just like you did, you go, well, you know what? I'm, I don't want to be an occupational therapist. I really thought about it. I, this isn't for me. So instead of like some kids may decide I'm just going to hammer through it, I'm going to, it could be a time waste. It could be a money waste. It could be a number of things. You just took a deep breath and said, you know what? I'm going to refocus. You found your career path and now look. So I, I've always said that like, you know, you, you alluded to earlier in this podcast, you know, we make mistakes, right? For sure. Whether it's on this podcast, as juvenile as it sounds, or in real life as guides or whatever, you know, but it's how you learn from them. And, and I think it was interesting to hear your story because I'm sitting here listening going like, geez, like, I did a very similar thing. I thought it was about the sports and I had this whole vision and boop, complete change of path um, to find out where you are. And then, like you said, everything happens for a reason. I, I believe in that. And, I do too. and you found your reason. I think I found my reason because one quick backstory on, on what I do and how I got here without telling the whole story is obviously I manage ice team and pro staff for clam, whatever. But when I was in 10th grade, Jason, true story, 10th grade in high school, I was 15 years old. The cliche, what do you want to be when you grow up essay? So we wrote this essay. This was 1997. We wrote this essay and our 10th grade English teacher put it in what they considered a time capsule. And when you graduate high school, um, you were, you read this time capsule and they also kept it. And at a later point in life, they brought it back. Right. So I wrote in 10th grade, I want to be a part of ice team. No way. The birth of ice team was in 1997. I went to the St. Paul ice fishing show. The only booth there was a booth called ice fishing. There wasn't a clam booth and all these different booths. There was a booth called, and you probably remember it. It just said ice fishing because it was the St. Paul winter sports right, show. Right, right. And so ice fishing was just a portion of this booth. As we know, the St. Paul show now is a beast. It's all about ice fishing. But back then it was a 50 by 50 foot ice fishing space. And there I met Dave Gantz. And there I signed up for this ice team newsletter. And there I got an official pin. And I went back that year and wrote about that's what I want to be. Well, fast forward, look what I'm doing. You want to talk about pretty darn cool. And when I went back, my teacher, when they retired, 
I went back to the retirement party. And this was after I had kids. So this was probably about 12 years ago. Jack, my oldest, was like one. And that teacher handed me that essay. And she goes, hey, wait a second. Didn't you just get a new job? I'm like, I did. I just got a new job working for Clam and Ice Team. You did, huh? Huh. Take this. And she handed me that piece of paper that I read, almost tears in my eyes, and my mom and dad are with me because we were celebrating this awesome teacher in the retirement. And here on this paper, it said, I want to be a part of Ice Team. And this was a couple months after I took a job for Ice Team. Unbelievable. How crazy is that? Two, two, things, yeah. two things on this. One, do you still have the pin that you got? I 100% do. Wow. It's on a Vexlar hat. And the second thing is, I'm actually, I, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you're in this position and have this role, and you really have found your way. Mm-hmm. And man, the influence that you've had on, on ice fishing and anglers and the impact that you've had is, is monumental. Um, but I am, to some degree, a little disappointed that you didn't become a high school math teacher because then I could refer to you as Math Johnson. Yeah. I have a math degree, so I finished my math degree. So I can still call you Math Johnson. You can call me whatever okay, you want. But, uh, and it's funny because I, it's not hereditary. You know math isn't hereditary. And maybe it is, and I don't know that, but I would assume it's not like my kids are going to be good at math because I like math. All four of my kids, Jason, way above all the standards in math. Oh, good. And, and it and my, drives my wife nuts because she's like, he didn't get that from me. And I'm like, she's always like, well, he's got a math degree. And I'm like, I don't think that equates to that they're going to be smart in math. But maybe, 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 maybe one of my kids will actually become a high school math teacher. Because my goal was to be a math teacher, coach a sport, do the whole thing, and uh, a little bit of a, a career path. But I, I, I love every minute of it. So Jason, the, the school teacher, and I think it's great. And the reason I... I I bring it up as one, it's great that people understand kind of your background and, and what you did. And I kind of wanted to know your story too. I didn't know some of that till right now, but I think what it's done for you, honestly, is one of your biggest strengths, I think in this industry, Jason, is how you educate. You know, I mean, I wrote it, a no- I wrote a note down here because I know this. So when I first learned about Jason Durham, I knew of you as this professional angler, right? Um, cool Jersey back in the day when sub dye didn't exist and you were the collared embroidered i got pictures in my head still uh national pro staff guy but honestly what really put you on the map for me uh was you wrote a bunch of books I wrote and that books. and that was that i was really into writing that was kind of my thing because back when i really got into fishing we didn't have facebook we didn't have cell phones that did anything cool we had fishing forums right and I was all over these fishing forums. I was writing. That was one of my strengths as a promoter was my ability to write. So I gravitated towards these other authors, whether it was you, Tom Grunewald, right, who mm-hmm. wrote a ton of books, yeah. uh, the North American Fishing Coalition, of yes. obviously the Linders and In Fishermen and all this stuff. I was, uh, I was that dork. I was obsessed, right? And I remember picking up some of your stuff, and I'm like, and I remember in a later life when we started working together 15 years back, I'm like, yeah, I remember first seeing some of the books you wrote. So you got to tell the story on how you got, did that. I, that to me, that's It's kind of cool. crazy, actually, because I've been doing a lot of outdoor writing, and I've, I've gotten to publish stuff in a, a lot of, you know, just about any fishing magazine that exists. Um, and, and I feel incredibly blessed for those opportunities, and I've written for newspapers, then whatever. But um, typically when you'd write a book, you would, you would write the, the entire book, right? And you'd send this manuscript into a publisher, trying, hoping that they would accept it and sure. you'd get published. And what typically happens is it gets rejected. So then you send it to another publisher and this happens over and over and over. And maybe when you send it to the you know, 75th publisher and, and take that shot, maybe they accept it. Mm-hmm. Or maybe nobody does and it just fizzles out. That's very common. Uh, the other way that you would get published is to use something called a vanity press. And that's where you write the book and you pay for it to be published. You pay for everything. But the downside of it is you're in charge of all the marketing and sales for it. Sure. So to get that into like a, a big bookstore or something or get it onto Amazon or, or wherever. Actually, I think Amazon's a lot easier now than it used to be. But um, to, to sell that book is all on you. So sure. it's difficult to have those sales to support what you've paid to have that book published. Well, for me, it was neither. What happened is I got an email from an acquisition editor 
that said, hey, I, I've read some of your writing online. I'd like to talk to you about publishing a book and actually publishing a fishing book. So initially I thought that that email was somebody trying to get me to publish from a vanity press because I would get those emails sometimes. Hey, we'll publish your book, 5,000 copies for what, X amount mm -hmm. of dollars. This was different and it was personal. He said he had read some of my stuff and that it was, the series was about fishing. So I, he said, give me a call and I, I called him up and he told me, you know, this is, this is a good opportunity. Uh, it, it's a, a good advance on it. It's great royalties. Like the contract is really good. And then he says, there's only one problem. And I thought, oh, here it comes. This is where he goes, you know, it's going to cost you X amount of dollars or whatever. He says, you have three months to get it done. And typically to write a book, you've got a year. Yeah. If you've got a contract months like that. Months. Right, exactly. And I was in charge of doing obviously all the writing, but all the photography too. And, um, you know, I, I took that leap and every waking moment, I would get up before school and write. I would stay up late and write. Every time I was at one of my kids' sporting events, and I hate to admit it, but I, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I should be writing right now. Sure. The night before the manuscript is due, I stay up all night long editing this. And I've been editing as I go, and I've been going through it over and over and over, but I'm going to do one final edit. And I stay up the entire night. I put the manuscript in the mailbox and I go and teach school on zero sleep, zero minutes of sleep. But I am riding so high on adrenaline that it's not a big issue. So about a week later, I get a call from the acquisition editor. I'm in school and so I can't take the call. It goes to my voicemail and he says, I received your manuscript, give me a call, we need to talk. <laughs> and I was, it, it took every, everything within me to give this guy a call back because I thought he's going to ax this and this and this. I'm going to have to start the whole process over. And this has been my life for the last three months. So I, I finally get up the nerve to call him and he says, I went through your manuscript. It's great. In fact, this is the cleanest manuscript I've ever held in my hands. He says, I need you to make these few changes. And, and through that process, I learned a lot about writing. Sure. Um, and he said, and I want you to write a second book. He says, the, the good news is... You were too good. He says, the good news is, this one you've got six months to complete. The problem was, I had just finished this. It, emotionally, it was a lot. Uh, just time-wise, it was a lot. And I'm going to jump right back into the same situation. But I've got six months. However, the second book is all about ice fishing. Mm -hmm. And it's over the six months where, really, there's no ice. So doing the photography... images. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, I was able to, to take some from my library. I was able to call on uh, Mike Hainer, who's done photography mm -hmm. for a long time, to, to help me out with a little bit. And, and some I just had to get creative with. You know, yeah. there's, there's one that I'll share. It's a picture of uh, a glow-in-the-dark jig. We were talking about luminescent paints and, and using these you know, little lights to make them glow. I took the picture on the 4th of July in my kitchen. And it looks just like you'd be out on, on the ice on the lake in the middle of winter. I closed all the shades. I took every ice cube in the freezer and put it in the blender, blender, put it in a cake pan, and took this picture, and you wouldn't know the difference. So, improvise. To improvise. So it was a great process. I don't write as much as I used to. I don't think you do as much as you used no. to. I don't no. think any of us do, it no, seems no. like. And, and I don't think there's as many people reading writing like they used to. They, they want that instant content. Right. A lot of videos are a lot of things that are very, very short. Good. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll be honest, like, you know, I one of my roles at Ice Team is to be the managing editor for our magazine. We have a print magazine, four digitals, as you know, and you contribute a ton of stuff. And uh, I'll be honest, Jason, like, I love every one of our pros dearly, consider them dear friends. But there's only a few of you that ever send me an article that I can go, ah, this one's ready to go versus a whole lot of red paint. Editing uh, with a battle axe. Yeah, and, and I don't expect them to. I mean, no. and, and I always tell, you know, anyone that is partnered on any of that kind of project, like, here's the deal. Every one of these pros that are on board our team are not here because they're writers. Right. Now, does it come with the territory on some of them? Sure. For sure. But I didn't bring so-and-so on to the pro staff because of the writing ability. Right. So you take it with a grain of salt, but, you know, it, it is neat. And it's funny you mention that because, yeah, writing was everything. 
I remember oh, right. spending hours on those forums and, and submitting articles to the chip leers for the fish in the wild side publications yeah. over the years. And to be honest, it's kind of a lost art. Like social media, um, good, bad, or indifferent has become very, very real time, very right now, very quick, hard hitting. You're not even seeing any of those, those long writing, writing articles anymore. Like we used to see, um, which is great. And if you ask the, the partners that are unfortunately print publication, they'd probably tell you the same thing. Like we're definitely seeing a little bit of a decline. Well, that's why you and I right now are not sitting at a computer writing. Right. That we're doing this podcast, the Correct. ST podcast, because that's what that's what people are right. wanting. That's what, how they want their information delivered. So if you're listening right now uh, with, uh, you know, through your radio, through your Bluetooth as you're driving up north mm-hmm. or driving somewhere, driving home from work and letting your mind wander a little bit, or maybe you're sneaking, sneaking this podcast yep. in while you're at work. Yep. Hopefully not whether you're sitting in church. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't, don't yeah. do that. But, uh, you know, we want you to have ease. Yeah, ease for sure. Super simple, great way to learn information. So, you know, a lot there we just threw at you. Obviously, uh, we, we, warned, we warned our audience we're going to go off on tangents. That's kind of our, our, the nature of the beast, you know. But uh, I want to continue to ask a few things, you know. I'd be remiss. Now, for those of you not watching this, if you're just listening, um, you're very proud about the shirt you have on. Uh, (laughs) Jason rolled into my office prior to this in a jacket. You know, it's late October. It's chilly out. And and, uh, we were just kind of joking about costumes and different attire. And and, uh, there's one species, I think, near and dear to your heart. And and I can see what your shirt says. Uh, the, The viewers probably even can't. But... His shirt says "Got Pout." Uh, well, and, actually, because I am a reading teacher, it says "Got, got, eel, got Eel Pout." Got, okay, "Got Eel Pout." I know it got it kind of got stuck in the middle of my peck, my massive. You pets. love that species, <laughs> and and I and I should say a lot of people do, and, and it's grown exponentially. We talked about exponential oh, yeah. growth in in what you're charging your clients on yeah. the guiding, <laughs> but when it comes to the the sport of chasing eel pout. Uh, when I was younger, to be honest, as much as I hate to admit it, uh, it wasn't a sporting fish, right? I remember, no. I remember growing up going to Mille Lacs, and you'd throw them on the ice. In fact, it was encouraged that you did that. I think even the DNR at the time, not to misquote, um, it was almost it was acceptable, right? I guess now, no, definite no, no, right? It's become a sport fish. Maybe maybe elaborate a bit on on how eel pout has grown to be this prestigious targeted fish now. Well, I'll tell you the, the, the number one reason that people have really latched onto this concept of eel pout fishing is the internet. That is the main driver for it, that, that people have seen others that go out and catch eel pout. It has almost become the hipster thing to do, mm-hmm. um, but, it, but it's not. It's the everyday person's fish. But it used to be that we were promoting eel pout as, you know, you can go home after work, You can eat dinner, put the kids to bed. You can still go out and fish for them. They're great to eat. Mm -hmm. There's no limit on them. Uh, Here's how you catch them. Now we're more focused on the conservation part of it than anything. And the DNR didn't have much for information of studies done on eel pout at all. Sure. And now that's starting to progress. And now the DNR has classified it as a a game fish. They're classifying it as a game fish. And we'll be putting a limit on it, which I think is a good thing. Mm-hmm. And and you're seeing fewer and fewer people that are mistreating the fish, that are calling them a trash fish. Because they're classified as a rough fish. Sure. But even a rough fish doesn't mean that it's a, a fish that's not viable. Right. Every, every species has a place in the ecosystem. Sure. And many people don't realize that eel pod actually have very stringent clean water requirements. They, they think of it like a dogfish for some reason, probably because it looks very similar in appearance. And they think they are in these shallow, muddy backwater bays and swampy, whatever. But they have to have very, very clean water. And if there was ever a decline in water quality, the eel pout would be the first fish that's effective. Sure. D- affected I didn't out, know that. out of an ecosystem. So, you know, like if you're a landowner on a lake, uh, we'll take, for instance, one of these studies that the DNR did where they put tracking devices into eel pout. Each tracking device was $700. They put 60 of them in, into 60 fish. 
and they tracked the fish for uh, about 14 months. Well, you think about that, that was $42,000 of tracking devices that you're putting into this rough fish. When I mentioned the study to anybody, they'd say, oh, there you go. Another good example of the DNR wasting our taxpayer dollars on this junk fish. Well, they didn't realize, like, this is an important fish. Mm -hmm. If we look at water quality in Minnesota, if you look at environmental change and changes in, uh, you know, water temperature, water quality, this is a big deal. Yeah. So that is a tiny bit of money to invest in our lakes. Absolutely. I, I think... I love targeting eel pout. I, oh, yeah. At times I struggle, and, and like you said, I, I'm actually, I commend the DNR for doing some of those th practices and, and giving them the attention they deserve because, you know, they're not as easy to catch as they once were. Like, you look at Malax, I just use that as an example because that's where I got my first right. taste of what eel pout was. Uh, I actually thought it was an alien when I first caught it. When I was 12 <laughs> years old in my buddy's fish house, we screamed uh, as loud as we could and woke up his parents. But... You know, I feel like I used to go out there and catch them all the time. It was not like a, an awkward occurrence where now I feel like, you know, they're not as easy to catch. And, and, and I love watching you, you guys on social media uh, during your eel pout excursions, whether it's you or Rylander or Brett McComas, right, and, and people really taking it more serious uh, and giving them the attention they deserve because they're a wonderful fish. My son, my oldest boy, who you know, Jack, who's 14, caught his first eel pout what was it, two years ago we went to Ice Team University in Lake of the Woods? Two, three years ago? Uh, we went out to Arneson's, took bombers out, super cool. And he caught about a 10-pounder in the middle of the day. And if you ask him right now, as a pretty spoiled kid when it comes to fishing, mm -hmm. let's call it what it is, he gets to do some pretty cool stuff. One of the most memorable fights of his life through the ice was catching an eel pup. And uh, those are memories you can't, you can't put a price tag on. You know, so cool to see i mean you know i know i know that eopo's going to get mentioned again at some point in this podcast in the future and i just know it will right it's oh, going to sure. happen 100%, 100%. so we don't need a pound on a two i just thought it was funny but i do want to say I, I do have to give a shout out because yeah years ago i wasn't interested in catching an eel pout whatsoever sure not at all so i do have to credit jason rylander mm -hmm. for persuading me to go out and he and i didn't know each other right jason and i met on the internet yeah we and we lived an hour away from each other but truly didn't know each other we just decided okay i finally gave in fine i'll go i'll go just to meet him whatever and i fell in love with it instantly but jason has to credit matt brewer yeah for for giving him the passion so it's just kind of like this this link this chain of of people and you know matt has some and that and that's what fishing is is passing it from right not just generation to generation, but from person to person. And sharing that information is easier today than ever. Yeah. I mean, because you have things like our podcast, mm -hmm. you have things like the internet, social media. Yeah. It's simple to get information. And when people are successful at something, it's highly likely that they're going to continue to take part in it. Yeah. People and want to be good at things. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned Brewer on the Eopal topic because that was one of my first real experiences other than like, accidentally catching him was with Matt Brewer 20 plus years ago on Lake Winnebagoshish. Yeah. I caught an eel pout during an event um, that won a prize. And I'll be honest at the time, I'm like, okay, I'll take the prize, but it's an eel pout. And when that day was over, Matt's like, well, do you want to go catch a whole bunch of them? I'm like, we can catch a whole bunch of these on purpose. He's like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. They're stacked up on some hump. They're loaded. You're going to catch one every drop. And I'm like, okay, whatever. By golly, man, like we did. And he just sat there like this was another day in the park. Like, like can't believe you didn't know about this. Right. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Like, they fight hard. If you keep a couple for dinner, they're wonderful to eat. They're challenging. It's, it's unique. Uh, but uh, I don't get to do it that much. You know, uh, where I'm here in the cities, we don't really have any eel pout. No. Uh, and, and usually when I do catch them, I'll be honest, it is by accident still. I'm on Lake of the Woods or, or Mille Lacs or Leech or doing something to that effect. Uh, but a super cool species that I think has warranted some attention. So um, I'm glad you got your Got Eel Pout shirt on. And uh, it actually literally plays into one of the bullet points I put on. And we did not plan the shirt. No. I had the bullet point on my list already to talk about. And in perfect Durham fashion, you got a shirt that just plays into it. So That's super. Hey, one, one more thing I was going to add. I, I was thinking about this the other day. There's a different podcast mm -hmm. that I really love. 
and if people want to look it up, it's called Daily Shower Thoughts. And it's on Spotify. Told me about this. I love this. I love Daily Shower Thoughts. It's five minutes long, and they just have these profound ideas. But we were talking about people want to be good at things. One of the quotes they had on there the other day was, uh, people, people who are good at things have a high tolerance for not being good at them. Sure. Because you have to put in time. Yeah. And I see that with fishing a lot, too, especially with ice rods. Yeah. Especially with ice rods that, that people want to buy the highest price, the absolute highest price ice rod they can to um, kind of make up for talent. Sure. I, 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 don't, I don't want to call it talent. I should call it experience. They, yeah. want, they want it to mitigate that, that lack of time that they have on the water when really they just need more time. Right. They need more time. Right. That's spot on because, like, Gens made a comment to me one time years ago, and we were just we were actually chatting ice rods, and obviously it's it's Dave Gens, right? Like, and he's just like, uh, well, I could catch fish with any one of these rods. Yeah. And he just pointed at all of them. Yeah. He didn't and say. And he could. He's like, I could go out and catch fish. And it wasn't an ego comment. No. It's just it, it, because he's got the experience. He's got, like you kind of said, the talent, whether it's, it's right or wrong. And, and he's probably right. Oh, he's 100% he, he, he's spot on. The thing I love about Dave, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Dave, because I, I enjoy him so much, and you were talking about it's not an ego thing. Dave does not have an ego. None. Yep. Anybody could approach him. If you see Dave Gens at an ice show, if you see him at a gas station, if you see him anywhere, approach him, because mm-hmm. he will talk to you about fishing, because he loves it. He's yep. passionate about it. And I was thinking about this last year. I get to spend a bit of time with Dave on the ice. He's got a cabin not far from me. We talk on the phone quite a bit. Um, And we spend time on the ice together. Well, if you just followed Dave around with a notebook, Mm -hmm. you would get all these gems, all these quotes that you just go, oh, my gosh, this is this is amazing. And he shared one last year that I'll never, ever forget. It applies to open water and ice fishing. He said, fishing's easy. Yep. Uh, Finding the fish when they're hungry is the challenge. Sure. Catching fish is easy. Finding the fish when they're hungry is the challenge. And that sums up all of fishing. All we're trying to do, it goes back to the whole Linder's idea of location right. plus presentation equals fish. Right? right. Right. And it's funny that you mentioned Dave and how approachable he is because we were with Dave yesterday. I'm um, just doing some video work or whatever, and, and uh, we were chit-chatting. And, and Dave is notorious for being told, go eat lunch yes. at a sports show because he just will talk to everybody whether yeah. you're five or 90 who have never ice fished or you're a pro that's just his thing so i notice i know that like kathy and missy his daughters at times be like dad you have to eat it's 2 30 yeah you know and and even when he's eating in line or even sitting down with his food he's still talking to someone and we were joking yesterday actually at lunch while we were doing this film stuff telling kind of some of those stories. And I said, Dave, I remember one time on Mille Lacs, we were doing a photo shoot on the ice. And uh, you're in such hot demand from all of your fans that even the fish can't leave you alone. You set your rod down on your knee so you could eat your sandwich, and you caught the biggest walleye of the day. Even the fish doesn't, don't leave Dave Gents alone during lunch when he's doing nothing, and he catches a big fish. So we got to go check all of that yesterday, that... And you're spot on. He, he, there is zero ego, the most humble yeah. guy. And if there's anybody that should have one oh my in, the, in this sport of ice fishing, 100%. that's him. Right. It's him. And he has zero. And he could it's Think crazy. about this. Dave could literally walk around the lake, and he could walk up to any angler and just go, you know, I invented that. Right. I invented that. Right. And, he, and he, could just, he could be like that, and he's not. Right. Not at all. But talking about the whole, like, idea of – of being innovative, Mm -hmm. right? Dave's agent, Dave's in his 70s, and he still has the high, high passion to fish absolutely as much as possible and to create and innovate. He's not not satisfied that he's created all these amazing fish houses, that he's created all this gear. I mean, a lot of people don't even realize what hand he's had in so much equipment in ice fishing but he continues to push that and push the envelope. Yep. Every time he's in my office, he's got another concept. He's got we something. We were filming yesterday at Shields, and Drew's sitting right here. And Dave pulls out a little scissors out of his pocket and is 
conceptualizing how we could use it for something for ice fishing. You know, for trimming silkies and doing this and doing that, which is another concept the guy came up with. And you talk about his passion. He leaves Shields yesterday with a bag of minnows to go fishing. And yeah. he's not catching his creek chubs right now on the river, right? Conditions, whatever. And it's, it's you know, frustrating probably for Dave. Shields had not to cause a mass influx into St. Cloud Shields. They have creek chubs there right now, October. Dave saw that. We lost all of Dave's attention and focus because he realized there was creek chubs there that soon after lunch, he grabbed a bag of creek chubs and he's out and he went fishing. So this is really his, his cup of tea um, and his passion, and, and he'll never slow down. I mean, I, him and I talk, and he's talked about, you know, maybe I'll just make some appearances at some of these ice fishing shows. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah, right, Dave. Right. You know, you're going to be the first one there and the last to leave. I know you well enough because this is, this is the legacy you are, and, and it, is, it is awesome. And you're spot on. Like, you talked about the notepad and following around. Like, we, Dave and I try to just go fishing together once a winter. Not for an event. I mean, we work together a lot, just like you are, but there's always, we always try to go one time a year where it's just us and he is so equipped mentally with the experience and everything it takes to catch fish that it's you almost have to ask how right because i have sat next to him where he will outfish you when the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour he's not using a spring bobber or a noodle no. rod he's got ice on his line he's wearing a pair of gloves and that guy sets the hook on every bite it's something else. So, you know, David, yeah, I mean, obviously we're doing an Ice Team podcast here. Ice Team wouldn't exist without Dave. Um, you know, again, not to get too sentimental. He'll make an appearance, I'm sure, at some point at one of these podcasts, maybe multiple times, who knows, um, and we'll do that. You know, you may hear some ambient noise in the background a little bit, and, you know, we're, we're filming these from a showroom at a warehouse, right? So, you know, if you're listening to this and you hear a, a, a forklift going on or you hear people talking, uh, business as usual here. We're filming here in the showroom at uh, Ice Team and Clam Outdoors, so uh, that just comes to the nature. So all good stuff. There's a, a couple other things I, I wanted to ask. You know, we talked a little bit about what happened the last several months. Yeah. You know, we're going to talk a lot about ice this year. And, and uh, one thing I wrote down, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bitter still, but, uh, you know, I guide on Lake Minnetonka all summer long, right? I'm out there 50, 60 days a year, and a lot of guides are out there longer than that, but uh, uh, that's the time I get out there. You, my friend, we have a company fishing outing every year <laughs> for Clam Outdoors. And we invite Jason. Jason comes out to our company fishing outing and takes a bunch of the gals in the warehouse out fishing every year. I mean, you're heavily requested. Um, you know, and uh, you came out here and you won it this year, I think. And you haven't come any further down the line than second in three years. Um, so maybe this is the bitter part in me, but uh, Jason came out here. I thought it was so awesome, and I gave him a, when we were doing a little award ceremony. I'm like, here's the deal. Like, here's somebody that lives in Park Rapids, Minnesota. You've never guided a damn Minnetonka in your life. In fact, never. you've been on Minnetonka a couple times for our event, and yeah. you show up, and you won the darn thing. But the coolest part about your day on the water that day is you rubbed it in even more because you told me <laughs> that you cooked cheese. Well, on the boat for, for our employees that were with you. And I was like, I, I, I can't trump this guy. It today. wasn't even that. It wasn't even that we just cooked cheese. It was that we never put the boat on plane. Right. You know, and, and we could have won that event the last couple of years. We've had the fish on to do it. I've, I love Minnetonka. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Minnetonka. I, I fished a couple other tournaments down here and, and have placed in only a couple. I, I don't spend a lot of time. In fact, the last year that I fished Minnetonka was in last year's yeah. <laughs> Clam Employee Tournament. But it's a lot like fishing at home. This, the, the Eurasian milfoil is very similar to northern milfoil sure. in terms of how you fish it and everything. And, and um, you know, I know a lot of people that love to fish braid in milfoil because you can rip through it and everything. We don't. Mm -hmm. We fish the eight-pound mono just like we do back home. And, uh, I, and I didn't approach it like a tournament because, you know, it, it wasn't high. 
You had cheese to cook. I had cheese to cook. <laughs> and a lot of people go, okay, wait a second. You cooked cheese in the boat? Come on. No, I'm I really so did. I really did. I, I have a little cooker, a little burner in my boat. That's a, it's a Seth McGinn's. There's yep. all these different brands that make them. But I actually won it at the, at the Gens Invitational Ice Fishing Tournament. Um, and I just have a little frying pan. There is a, an amazing cheese that's called bread cheese. Okay. And a lot of people don't know about it. I, I just started making it in the last couple of years. The main reason I didn't buy it in the past is because it's called bread cheese. Um, but it is a 200-year-old Scandinavian recipe. You put this in a frying pan. It browns the exterior like the brown crispy cheese on pizza. And the inside is Wisconsin squeaky cheese. It's incredible. You can find this at a number of different places, Sounds especially good. you know if you're in the in the metro area, in the Minneapolis area. There's a lot of places that have it. I found it at Aldi, but I heard they stopped carrying it now. Uh, if you go to Wisconsin, all these cheese makers. Well, clearly they they yeah. have they have <laughs> some, um, but you can look it up online too. You can even buy it from Amazon. It costs about double yeah. on Amazon, but bread cheese. But yeah, and I cook that in the boat a lot. When when I do guide trips, we make it almost every. Oh, just because sounds amazing. Well, we were talking earlier about, you know, like uh, what people remember on these, these guide trips and, and educating and everything, and that we don't have to catch limits. Mm -hmm. That we don't have to catch limits. There are very few memories that I have about fishing that are actually about fish, especially for uh, from a standpoint of looking at back on my past as like a kid going out fishing. Agreed. Yep. And and when I take guests out in the boat or on the ice, because we make it on the ice all the time too, is uh, they go, God, you remember when, remember when Jason made that cheese when we were ice fishing? They don't remember the hundreds of panfish that we caught or the, the cheese, you yeah. know, the second biggest walleye of their life. They go, oh, that cheese was really, that I gotta was something. make that cheese. Yeah, you do. I was jealous because you, you got done fishing and the, and the, the employees that were in your boat came over and, you know, and you won the tournament. You had the biggest bass, and you won the tournament, right? We did. But those employees were telling me about the cheese they ate in the boat. So exactly how you just played out the scenario of, they don't remember their second biggest walleye or the hundreds of... No. Just like what happened at our company fishing derby is the guys and gals in your boat were like, yeah, he made cheese for us. I'm like, he did what? The dude comes into my backyard, wins the derby, and Drew's sitting here because Drew was in my boat, so Drew's probably a little bitter still too. Yeah. And uh, and then he cooks cheese. It's you know? part of it is that it's so absurd that you would cook cheese in a boat, and Agreed. people go, "Well, doesn't it melt all over?" No, it doesn't melt all over. Yeah. I will give you two tips for it. Though. Okay. Number one, cut it, cut it into strips before you fry it, because then it'll make all the sides crispy. Okay. And number two, bring marinara with. And like like a big mozzarella stick. Yeah. So so the, the marinara, all you got to do. After you've cooked these, you know, bread, bread cheese sticks in the frying pan, in your boat, or on the ice, dump them onto the, the plate, and then just dump the marinara into the pan that's already hot and kind of swish it around a little bit, and it's going to heat up in like a minute. And then just dunk that bread cheese, and then they're just like cheese curds and oh. cheese sticks. It's so good. What time is it anyway? Are we close to lunch? Uh, you, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm kind of hungry now. I got the cheese sweats all of a sudden. <laughs> See, I cook brats for my clients on oh, the ice every day. Oh, I do that too. I do too. I'm going to have to up use, my game. Do you use the, the cooker? Do you use the Johnsonville No, I, I just use, use a little a propane grill because I usually don't have any power out there right. with me. Right, uh, But I'll be honest, like, and, and, and Drew can attest too, like, we're so sick of brats at the end of ice fishing season yeah. that I don't want to look at one. Uh, but it, it, it makes a difference. You know, like you said, um, there's days where the fishing is second, right? You know, whether it's your cheese or, or brats or something. Like, I've had many days, especially in the winter, when conditions are usually not usually ever ideal. Like, we're in Minnesota. Like, right. in the winter, a good day is like, oh, it's going to be in the 20s, right? Where I got a lot of friends who are like, you're crazy. Well, you know, you cook some brats and you give them a nice Johnsonville cheddar brat for, for lunchtime. I don't care what the bite's like. You know, they got this renewed energy. They're ready to rock. They're they're amped up. Or so ready like, to take a nap after oh, eating. So your cheese thing, man, I, I I thought it was awesome when I heard that this year. And, and at first, I'll be honest, um, I thought you were pulling my leg. <laughs> I thought there was some kind of there was something else coming here, a joke about I cooked cheese in the boat. And, and and then I learned absolutely not real deal. And then Addie, who's our head of marketing at Clam, mentioned the same thing. You went fishing with her, and she's like, Yeah, you cooked cheese for us in the boat. And she's like, it was 
the best cheese. Yeah, it's, it was it's life changing. It's life changing cheese. So I'm doing it. Man. I do. I do have bread to... cheese, Drew. Put that on our list. We're gonna be on the ice a bunch. We're cooking bread cheese. We're cooking bread cheese on the <laughs> podcast. I I did want to back up for brats for a second. Yeah. You're talking about how you'd be sick of brats by the end of the ice season. Brats are the social catalyst of ice fishing for the hardcore angler. Because sure. if you think about this, if, if, you're, if you're in a fish house, if you're in a hard-sided fish house, that's pretty easy because you're constantly having conversation just like you're sitting in your living room. But for the hardcore anglers, I think about so many times when I go fishing with some of our pros that we're out on open ice. We're 15, 20 feet away, 30, 40 feet away from each other the entire day. We're constantly moving, factor in wind, You've got your hoods up. You're not just talking back and forth. You're not sharing life. You're not going, hey, how are the kids doing? You know, you're, you're fishing parallel to each other. But brats are the social catalyst it because you, it brings everybody in, and that's when you have yep. the conversations. Yep. So I, kudos to brats. I love brats. I'm kind of in the point now where I'm ready to eat some, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk in March and see if that's still the case. Um, <laughs> there's something else I think's cool about Jason, many things, but just things that kind of stand in my brain. Like you're a man of many personalities, and I and I, I don't mean that on a medical level. Uh, I mean, it, like for example, we do a big event pro day, and you've come in and you've helped cook, and you're wearing a chef's outfit. Uh, we've done many shows, and you come in in different costumes and outfits. Like you know, you very well could be an entertainer by trade. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think it's it's funny because we were talking about uh, I, I put a note costumes on my list here to talk with Jason about because I feel like you're always trying to be innovative and creative too to just get people to laugh and that's and, the, and get engaged and be excited and I think it's just a breath of fresh air. You know that's that's what it is. It's laughter. If if I was going to sum up the goal of my entire life, and that would be to get people to smile and laugh. Mm-hmm. If I've succeeded in that, yep, I've I've, I've won. I mean, if you, think, if you think about it, like laughter is one of the most intense natural feelings you can have in your body. It feels good to laugh. It feels good to smile. You can make a phone call and the person on the other end picks it up and you can hear if they're smiling on the phone. Sure. Uh, laughter, laughter is the climax of any conversation. Laughter is the same in every language. Yep. I mean, it's a big deal. Last year uh, for school pictures... I, I got my, my school picture taken, and I went back the second day that they were taking these pictures because I felt like I had let down society. Mm-hmm. So I came with a mask, and I had a 100% human hair mustache from Bangladesh that I ordered off of Amazon for like $25, and I'm wearing this. Is that your I, chef's mustache? It was. It was the okay. same. I, I, tried, I, tried, awesome. I, tried, I tried to get more than one it's use awesome. out of it. And so I sit down in front of the photographer with this, this paper mask on, and she asks my name, and I tell her, and she goes, oh. And I say, oh, yeah, I, I was here yesterday, but I wanted to do a retake. And so she's kind of fiddling with the camera, and I take off the mask, and she looks up and sees me, and she says, okay, smile, and clicks the picture and goes, okay, you're done. She never said anything about it. So this was my photo for my staff ID on the school website. You know, all of these different things in, in, the, in the annual yearbook. And there, there was another educator that didn't like that I had done that, that they thought it was unpro- unprofessional. Now, a couple of things. One is, had I naturally grown that mustache, which I could never do because I feel like I still, I feel like I might hit puberty maybe like next <laughs> year and be able to grow facial hair. That'd be super cool. But Someday. if I had done it naturally, it, nobody would have thought anything else you know, anything of it. In reality, having that mustache on for a staff ID and on the school website, whatever, big deal, Mm -hmm. right? And the third thing is, you know, in, oh, 30-some years, I maybe am not going to be around anymore. But the kids in my class in 32 years are going to be celebrating their 20th class reunion. Yep. And my only wish would be that one of them would go back to their kindergarten yearbook and they'd see that picture of me wearing that silly mustache and one of them would laugh and go, yep. that was a great... I remember that Mr. Was great. I remember Mr. That was funny and it made them laugh. Yeah. It would all be worth it. 
Amen. And so, you know, if I can give advice to anybody in life, smile more, laugh more, because it simply feels good. I'd agree. And it's funny because when I, I had this costume note on my thing, you and I were on the phone, I don't know, was it two days ago, just kind of just kind of preparing ourselves mentally for this, and we're talking, and we're kind of running through. I mean, there's a lot of logistical stuff to do a podcast, right? And we're learning, whether it's the microphones we're talking on, the computer programs, the cords, this and that, and, and we're going to kind of go separate directions, right, yeah. and run. And, and I know you and I were talking like, hey, man, if there's something you ever need that maybe breaks down, like go ahead and get it and expense it, whatever, right? And then your response to me was... <laughs> So what you're telling is, do we have a $5,000 budget for a really kick-butt eel pout cost? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's, and I'm la- I was laughing out loud when you said that because I had already <laughs> put down on my notes, Jason, the man of many, many costumes, and here he is right away uh, talking about this cool eel pout cost. So I, do, I, do, I do have a bin of costumes in my basement because at, at our school, our school, Nevis Public School, we're, we're very traditional. We still have... Uh, a, a Halloween parade and a costume mm-hmm. parade. Our kids get out on Wednesdays for church school for an hour. We have a school Christmas program, and we stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. You know, it's kind of awesome. the old school format. Yep. But I love getting dressed up for Halloween, and not in something scary. I hate scary things. Fear and anger are two feelings I don't invite into my body. But to do something silly, I've gone as an avocado, a three-toed sloth, a giraffe, uh, a... a Somebody who jumps out of airplanes. Is there a name for that? Uh, paratrooper? Well, I don't know. Non military jumps out of planes. Oh, skydiver. Skydiver. There we yeah. go. Thank you. I, I've done tons of costumes <laughs> and, and just to make kids laugh. Yeah. You do a good job, man. Where are we at for time? I guess I'm not even. Are we. Oh, so well maybe we look at wrapping it up. I mean, we would do, talk. Do you think people. Forever. People right now could. are going, gosh, when are these guys going to be? Uh, well, they don't I know have, us that well, then, if that's the do. case. Uh, I mean, I think we should, before we, we wrap this up, we should maybe talk about maybe a couple of our goals Yes. Uh, for this podcast. You know, we, we alluded a little bit earlier on, but, you know, maybe some, uh, maybe some little bit of foreshadowing yeah. on some things. Uh, I, I already know a couple of people we're going to bring on. Uh, or maybe just some things that, that you want to see out of the podcast. Uh, when we sit back down, let's say, at the end of the year and, how did season one go? What are some things we'd be proud of? And um, maybe that's a good way to, to conclude the opening episode of this Ice Team podcast with, with your two hosts. And again, if you're, if you're just tuning in now, um, myself, Matt Johnson, and Jason Durham across me are going to co-host this podcast. Uh, this will probably be one of the few times we're with each other where Jason's going to go his direction. I'm going to go mine. We're going to meet in the middle at times, probably at shows, but we're going to kind of spread our wings and fly to cover more topics and get with more people. Uh, but, uh, you know, just, just some things, you know, what we plan to do is, is I think there's going to be a youth element involved. 100%. And, and clearly, obviously, we're going to have, uh, I'm thinking some people on board that don't even ice fish. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? We're going to so, talk to people about everything revolving around fishing, the outdoors. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, when we go to some of these ice shows, some of the promoters yep. talking about their journey. Right. I mean, I don't think you just wake up one morning and go, you know what? I think I'm going to start an ice <laughs> fishing show. Definitely not. There's a process there. Yeah. And we want we want to share that. Yeah, we're going to do that. We got, uh, we're going to have some... Uh, some YouTube influencers that I think a lot of our audience know well and probably follow, uh, make some appearances. Uh, we're going to get creative. But like we said, too, like if, if I could go six months from now, whenever we're done with this and look back on the year, uh, I would feel good knowing that uh, we get some participation from our listeners and viewers 100%. telling us or asking, can you do this? Can right. you talk about this? And, and we can look back saying, you know, we fulfilled some of that. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, as educators, like you know, uh, it's a very selfless behavior, and it needs to be. Uh, whether it's you as a teacher, you as a promoter, uh, at the end of the day, we're not talking to hear ourselves talk. No. It may appear like that after a hundred and hour and twenty four minutes, but we're not. We're doing this to give our listeners some level of entertainment education. So, hit us up with what you want to hear. And, and we see. want it. We want to hear from everybody. Who do you want to see on the show? What topics do you want us to cover? Like Matt said earlier in the podcast, just reach out on social media. You can find any of us you can find any of us uh you can comment right. on just in the comment section yeah. of, yep. of this podcast or you can reach out facebook instagram all yep. of the things 
Yep. So you're it's gonna not have, hard to find us. No, you usually can find us, uh, in good or bad or in different. Uh, now, you're going to have a busy winter. Yeah. Um, you're going to be guiding. Uh, I mean, just to kind of maybe give them a teaser here, because this is going to be our first episode that will actually air before any of these upcoming sports shows. Uh, I can tell you right now, you're, you're probably going to see Jason and I at almost every event, uh, one or us. I mean, you're going to be, oh, boy, you're going to be at the, the Blaine, Blaine Ice Machine. Well, first, Sioux, Sioux Falls. Falls. Yep, uh, Sioux Falls, which is a really great show. Yep. I mean, that's that's a huge show. And to tell you honestly, you can get some of the best deals of the entire ice fishing yep. season. A lot of times people think, oh, wait until the last show. You know, Todd down in Sioux Falls. Might not be anything left right. at the last show. Oh, yeah. We've, we've run into that the last couple of years. So. Yep. That's yep. time to buy. And yep. what a great location for it, too. Just centrified. Numerous states can go there. It's outstanding. We got Ramsey coming up, the first one here, end of the month. You're going to be um, at that one. I'll be I at won't. that one. You yep. won't be. We're going to both connect at Sioux Falls. Obviously, we're both going to be at the Hardwater Expo in Blaine. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, Thanksgiving it up. You're going to be, I think, at Reed's I'll be at all Reed's weekend. So I don't know if we'll be doing a podcast there or not, but come by, check it out. And then, obviously, the big dance, St. Paul. Fargo. So there's a lot going on now until Christmas uh, where we're going to be uh, doing podcasts. You can come check things out. You can ask questions, uh, you know, maybe get Durham's uh, bread cheese recipe from them. You know? It's easy. Buy the cheese, yeah. cook it, eat it. <laughs> Pretty simple. So I'm super excited, man. I mean, you know, when we first came to Tame Delight about this and, and, and you wanted to do it, I thought this is what completes this podcast. It's, you know, I'll be honest, like I didn't want to do all the hosting on my own. We're busy, you know, four kids, working a full-time job, doing the guide thing. And uh, I thought, I know who would like to do this. So when you said yes, man, it takes a burden off of all of our chests here. And, and I'm just excited to see what direction we go. And I think we're going to make it entertaining, make it fun. And uh, hopefully everyone listening and tuning in uh, can say the same thing. And, and if it's not, tell us. <laughs> we oh, got thick skin. I got thick skin. You have thick skin. You're an elementary or kindergarten teacher. Um, you, so, say, you say I complete the podcast, Matt. Yeah, you complete you, you the podcast. Complete me. Yeah, you Thank complete you. me. Yeah, so uh, that a lot of fun. So really, on behalf of, of Jason Durham, Matt Johnson here, and Ice Team, and, and all this, uh, I'm super excited for this season's podcast. And uh, we don't know how many we're going to do. Uh, going to be a lot, I think. I think that's my gut feeling. And uh, uh, we're excited to bring some enti- entertainment to all of our fans, and hopefully, take an approach they've never heard before. Right. What do you think? Well, thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode one of the Ice Team podcast. We're kicking it off with both your hosts, Jason Durham and myself, Matt Johnson. And you can't see the fist bump on, well, you can see it on camera, but if you listen, you can't see the fist bump. I just fist bumped Jason Durham. Good friend. We're looking forward to this. Tune in all season long. (laughs) 